Welcome to another inspiring and timely message from our pastors here at the Crossroads. Today's message is about rejection. And what does the Bible say about rejection? Rejection is something that all of us have to face. And how we deal with rejection, how we handle it, whether it's rejection that is deserved. I mean, sometimes we get rejected and it's because you're not ready for prime time. You're not ready for that game. You need to get rejected. You need to be refined. You need to go through certain things to be in the right place at the right time for the right hour to be used by God in certain areas. But there's other rejections that we know that it was the enemy of our soul trying to discourage us. And there's a lot of things that the enemy will try to do to destroy us and break us down in the area of rejection. And we've all had to face it. It is part of living. You are going to go through rejection. If you're an actor out in Hollywood, I mean, those classic stories of, you know, they're rejected for 200 times, but then all of a sudden you're the right person at the right time, at the right moment. And it's amazing the things that can happen to our lives. But I was reading a story my sister sent me the other day. She's always sending me something from the old country, uh, from Minnesota, where I was born, with all those Scandinavians up there. And uh, she has it, it, it makes a big full circle, because she's out in, she's living in the wine country up in Northern California now, but she still has friends and, and cousins in, in Minneapolis and different parts of Minnesota. Hello, Minnesota that might be watching today. But uh, she sent me something that one of her cousins sent her about a guy named Sparky. And it so happens, uh, she made a little note of it. She says, Sparky used to live on the same street that my mother did way back in the day uh, during World War II. And Sparky, his, his parents, uh, his father was a barber. And they had a little barber shop, and they lived in a little apartment up above the barber shop. But Sparky uh, had dreams in his heart, but he went through years of utter rejection. He was rejected. He, he failed the eighth grade, had to do it over again. He failed several courses in high school, he had to start over again and again. He went through all kinds of rejections. He, he made it to the golf team, and then at the big tournament for the year, he's the one who caused them to lose. And then they had a consolation round, and he caused them to lose that. And so it was like, oh my gosh, everything he seemed to do, he got rejected, and he felt so depressed and so bad about himself. Like, why me? Why do I have to always be the one that loses? And then he graduated from high school and went off to war, and he said it was the loneliest time in his life. He never knew what loneliness really was until he was off uh, in the army. But he came back, and he fell in love, and then all of a sudden, the woman he fell in love with rejected him and went out and married another guy. And it was like everything he did turned out bad and he felt so rejected and so alone now he could have given up when he went through this rejection and said well I, that's, that's just a fact I'm just no good I'm a loser but Sparky did something else he liked to draw and so Sparky began to draw and express himself through his loneliness and through his sorrow and even when he was in the army overseas he would do these drawings when he got back home instead of taking his sadness and trying to hide it like so much of us do by putting a shell around us he wrote about his sorrow through drawings and then he went out and he tried to sell himself with, with these concepts and ideas and even went to Walt Disney. But Walt Disney didn't need him. Walt Disney 
Artie was pretty good at drawing, and he knew how to draw Mickey Mouse. And so he could have ended up working for Walt drawing more Mickey Mouses, but he would never have been able to draw what he was expressing in his heart. Finally, in 1950, uh, a company that published, uh, connected with the newspapers across America, took up his uh, drawings and little by little, he began to develop an audience and people seemed to relate to Sparky. But they, you know, at first he wanted to call it Little People and they said, no, 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 we don't like that name. And they kept up with the name of Peanuts. And all of a sudden was birthed the stories of Charlie Brown and Snoopy and Lucy Van Pelt and Linus and all of this little community where he represented truly what he felt in feeling like the, the guy that could never quite get it right. Always had two left feet. He always seemed to somehow uh, see things not work out to his benefit. And, and so through that, people around the country could identify with Charlie Brown and he made the world a different place. Now again, my sister today lives in the white country. She's not in Minnesota anymore. But right down the road from her, she's always going to Charlie Brown's and Snoopy's headquarters. And at this headquarters is a huge training ground for service dogs. And the service dogs that you'll see here in this community, some of them come from Northern California at Charles Schultz's a ranch where they are trained each year to be able to service people who are blind, service people who have different issues going on their, in their lives and need help, and all because of little Snoopy and, and Charlie Brown. Sometimes it's good to be rejected. Sometimes it is your absolute benefit to be rejected. But that's the key, is being able to recognize whether this is a rejection that is healthy and is from God, or is this a rejection that we need to stand against and fight the good fight of faith. First Peter 2.4 tells us, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God. Little Sparky got rejected by that young lady. But God had a better plan for him. God had the right woman for him. God had the place for him. God had and saw him as being a precious stone that was being developed, being refined, being prepared to fit into the slot, fit into the place where God would use him and benefit mankind. How many of you want to see Mankind benefited by your existence. You don't want to just spin your wheels, but you want to do something worthwhile. Then as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious in the sight of God, you have to see yourself. 2 Corinthians 12.9 says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Do you want to see perfection in your life? Then you need to allow him to perfect you. And that comes through rejection. It comes through failure. If we always got our way, if we always got everything we wanted, we would never appreciate what we have. But God is making perfection through our weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. It's really interesting when you look at Charlie Brown. He's a great example of that. He was making a boast in his weakness. Instead of ignoring it, instead of hiding it, instead of acting like everything's perfectly okay, Everything is well. No, he would talk about the fact that he would get depressed. He would talk about the fact that sometimes he felt lonely. He would talk about the fact that he didn't always do everything right. 
And people identified with him by his honesty. It's one of the things I appreciate about Pastor Sandra. You'll hear all these great spiritual leaders. And there's all different types out there. I'm not saying everyone has to do it the same way. But one of the things I've always uh, respected about Sandra is the fact that she is able to take the honesty of exposing herself, not with the things that she's going through at the moment. You won't know about those things. But she will use her own failures and her own humanity as an illustrated sermon to help others to be able to bridge the gap to go from darkness into life. And that's one of her greatest strengths. And that over the years, that's what uh, churches from throughout the world have invited her back because she's one of the few that are truly honest about her mistakes. Truly honest. I'm, I'm more proper and careful. I'm not going to easily <laughs> reveal to you my mistakes. But I have learned from her, and I've learned to be more open as a result of it. And just like a Charlie Brown, we have to learn to be honest and open enough to admit when we are broken, admit when we are hurt, admit when we have a problem, admit when we aren't smart enough or fast enough or strong enough, and use it to turn it for good instead of evil. That even here, as the Word taught, said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. Because it is Christ who has freed us. It is Christ who has done this in our lives. Anything good that we do or ever hope to do is because of Jesus. Isaiah 53, 3. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. Until you're familiar with pain, you might say, okay, I get it. I, I got the prize. I got the t-shirt. I've had enough pain. But God's grace is sufficient for us. And he will not place on us more than we can bear. That's what his word promises. Like one from whom people hide their faces, we despised. He was despised and rejected by mankind. But Jesus wants to take the foolish things to confound the wise. James 2.13 says, Because judgment without mercy will be shown to no one who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Sometimes the people who have been rejected the most get the hardest in their hearts because they don't want to continue in that pain, and so they'll put a shell up, and they will do the very thing that has been done to them. But God is inviting us to show mercy that when you've been through rejection, when you've been turned down, that it makes your heart compassionate towards others instead of judgmental towards others. And as we do that, God can absolutely use us as an illustrated servant, not just one that's being preached up here, but that is being lived out to save such a generation as this to see the salvation of the Lord in our homes, to see the salvation of the Lord on your job, to see the salvation of the Lord on your labor and in your leisure, to see God's mercy and grace because we don't give eye for an eye, but we show mercy. We demonstrate mercy. We demonstrate grace. I would much rather be accused of giving too much grace than giving too much judgment. You know, God, God has a way of dealing with things and with people. And if He wants to bring judgment, it can happen very swiftly and very suddenly. But it is, it behooves me because he has been so merciful to me. 
that I demonstrate his grace, that I demonstrate his mercy, that I express his love instead of rejecting other people the way perhaps you and I have been rejected in the past. What a wonderful, glorious, awesome responsibility we have to walk in the grace and the mercy of God, that he would entrust in us human vessels, vessels with flaws, Vessels with obvious weaknesses, the more we get to know each other, the more we know how human we really are. And yet, that the glory and the light of a loving God would shine through us because we choose to not reject, but to love. We choose to not become embittered. It's the people who become embittered because of their rejection, who put up these shells and then dish it out the same way it has been dished to them. But let's do an opposite spirit. Let's operate in love instead of with rejection. It is the healthiest. It is the most productive. It is the best thing that we can have going for ourselves by showing his grace because he has been grace-filled towards us. Philippians 4.19. And, and this is what we've got to believe this, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of His glory in Christ Jesus. We want to hoard things up. We don't want to protect ourselves from being hurt. We want to protect our assets emotionally by not allowing ourselves to be broken again after we've been hurt and disappointed. But God will meet all of our needs according to his riches if we trust in him. Psalms 27.10, though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Even our own parents sometimes will not understand us. They can't always get it. You don't always get it about yourself. You don't fully understand yourself. But we have to trust that the Lord will receive us. The Lord will work it all together for good. And if we will honor our fathers and mothers, if we will honor them and trust God, not trusting them as much as we are trusting God, then God will truly work it all together for good. And take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desire of your hearts. He knows our hearts. God knew Charlie Brown's heart that was revealed from its author, Charles Schultz. And God wants you to be expressive of who you're created to be. Charlie Brown or Charles Schultz would have made a terrible mistake if he would have pressed down those emotions instead of dealing with them humbly and being willing to draw them out and portray it in a character that expressed his heart and his sense of failure at times. But so identified with the common man that it it made him millions upon millions of dollars, which still goes on to this day in blessing others. So take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. For the Lord will not reject his people, he will never forsake his inheritance. But you have to believe that you matter in the sight of God. And no one can do that for you. You have to believe what his word says. But if God's word is true for others, it's true for you. Because he made you. He knew exactly how tall you would be. He knew exactly how wide you would be. He, would, he knew exactly the color of your eyes. He knew exactly 
the personality that you would have. And God did a good job in making you. But you have to let his light shine. For the Lord will not reject his people. He will never forsake his inheritance. And last, Psalm 118, verse 22 says, The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Today, as the, as the worship team comes, uh, I want us to examine our hearts for a moment because I believe that there are some great cornerstones that God has placed here in this congregation. I believe that there are some lives that are unique, and very special, that have not fit in everywhere. And you've tried to fit yourself in to this group, to that endeavor, into this relationship, into the things that seemingly would be what you wanted. And instead, you just get rejected, you get broken, you get trampled on. But in the process, Jesus is refining you. And I know it's easy to, for, for someone else to say when you're the one that's going through it. But I believe that Jesus loves you so much and he trusts so much in how he made you, how he formed you, that there is rhyme and reason, there is divine purpose for your existence and that you are called to be a cornerstone in the endeavors for your life for your generation, for your placement within this community, on your job, in your home. And there are things that God wants to do through each and every one of us that is only going to happen if you don't miss the mark. But if you become embittered, if you give up, and say, well, I've been rejected, and so I'm going to reject you. If you give up and you run away from the battle instead of facing. I mean, look at the classic example in the Bible. Genesis, I think the fourth chapter. I'm talking about Cain and Abel. They both brought a sacrifice to God. One was a farmer. And one was a herder of animals. And it says that and there's nothing wrong with being a, a farmer. But it said that God rejected Cain's sacrifice that he brought, the grain offering and the, and the result of his being a farmer, that God rejected it. And it might seem, well, that's unfair. But yet later in the Old Testament, there was... Uh, provision made for the sacrifice of, of grain offerings. But this time, God specifically said, no, I want it to be the fat and the flesh, which could have been symbolic of, of Christ's sacrifice for us. But regardless of what the reason was, it's interesting in how the two people dealt with it. Cain could have gone through that rejection and said, okay, Lord, how do you want me to deal with this? How do you properly? And he could have given Abel an offering and then received the animals needed that would be a sacrifice. But instead, it said that he lowered himself. And it was all about the attitude of his heart because he felt like he was being rejected. And so in dealing with his rejection what did he do it was God who said this is not the right sacrifice but yet he turned around and he killed his own brother because it was unfair because somehow he wanted to be the one that was recognized and God was recognizing Abel God sees the attitude of our heart 
He knows why sometimes we need to go through rejection. Do not allow a spirit of murder to be birthed in your heart. You may not physically go out and murder someone. Heaven forbid. But you may commit murder in your heart because of your ego, because of your attitude that rejects others when God is wanting you to humble yourself before Him so that you can be polished, you can be purified, you can become the cornerstone to great endeavors in Jesus' name. This is the end of the teaching from our pastors. For more information, visit thecrossroads.org or download our app in the App Store. Thank you for listening.